everybody. Hi. Thank you very much for joining us in this uh, session, which, uh, despite of its very long title, is uh, pretty much going to look at the ways private sector can contribute to the long-term value creation and sustainable uh, economic growth, and the way this profession uh, can uh, be part of this process. So when we were preparing this event, uh, we we are trying to create a narrative which could be described as foundations and frontiers. In the other words, we were trying to have a mix of sessions which will address the issues with which you are dealing in your current personal lives, but also will make you think about what may become part of your professional lives in the coming years. So this particular session is clearly falling under the frontiers category. And um, to bring this into the context of the discussions that we have had yesterday and this morning, think about where this region uh, is finding itself right now. We are in the situation where the economic growth has returned to most of the countries, however, it is not sufficiently high. At the same time, many governments are dealing with the issues of the tight fiscal space which means that they are looking for the opportunities to bring private sector into the picture and to make private sector a big player in helping their citizens live better and helping their economies to grow. So, of course, as always, devil is in details. So uh, it's good to say that the private sector should be part of this, but exactly how? And once again, there are traditional ways of doing this uh, by creating public-private partnerships. Uh, focusing on such sectors as infrastructure, uh, energy, um, education in some cases, but also their innovative ways. And innovation would be linked to the fact that we will use some new tools and new methods to incorporate the new way of thinking of uh, in, into the mainstream operations and strategy of the private sector, so that businesses will find the value in doing good while doing well. So, and the reason why we included this session into this event is that this particular audience, the professionals who are working with accounting, auditing, finance, in both private and public sector can be a very big part of this process. Uh, so in the course of this session, we are going to explain exactly how this could be achieved. So I will uh, explain the flow of the panel uh, so that you could follow. We will start, we have a very interesting set of speakers with us. We will start with Peter, uh, and I'm going to read his short biography a bit later, who actually works for the Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies, which is the international think tank focused on megatrends. Uh, in a way that they're trying to define how our future is going to look and what does this mean for uh, businesses and governments. So Peter will tell us a little bit about our future. We'll see how accurate can, he can be. <laughs> <laughs> then we will move on to Tim Yeomans. Tim uh, has, wears many hats. He's a scholar in uh, the MIT. He does research with a few Harvard-based uh, professors. He also works with the organization connecting uh, CEOs of the largest U.S. corporations. And he will anchor what Peter, Peter will discuss into the realities of the private sector. What does this mean for the private sector? Then we will move to Andrea. Andrea is the head of the Global Reporting Initiative for Latin America. Also in her previous uh, lives, she was part of the uh, task force set up by the government of Colombia, which uh, was focused on defining the strategy for the implementation of sustainable development goals. Um, and she will uh, speak about the reporting initiatives, which are trying to anchor all this work into the realm of information disclosure. Finally, Ed Alovo Akere, who is the director in the World Bank of the Global Governance Practice, uh, will sort of bring all this together uh, and help us to understand how, what exactly this can mean for, the, um, for this particular audience. So, uh, Peter, 
Yes. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me have this one. Oh, I will uh, decide to stand up a little bit so I don't have to look all the time at the slides. <clears throat> and I hope everybody understands me. Eu, eu show up lo español, mas estoy muy bagunzado porque eu moro, I live in Sao Paulo and then I learn Portuguese. So my Spanish Portuguese is kind of a mess. So I'll do this presentation in English. I hope everybody understands. <laughs> so I always do. Uh, do a little question. Has anybody heard about the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies? Anybody know us? No. <laughs> I always say that we are a small little secret institute. <laughs> so we have been, just to tell a little bit about uh, who we are. Let's see here if it works. Well, anyway, so uh, it, uh, Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, we are a private NGO. Um, and we have were founded in 1970. Our founder, he was used to be the general secretary of the OECD countries from 60 to 69. And he was a former finance minister. So when he came back to Denmark, exactly, here we are. So we can, when he came back to Denmark, he came back with the prof profound insight that the world was getting ever, ever and more complex. And in order to avoid destruction of value in society, it was fundamental to prepare for what the future has in store for us. And with this, he founded the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies in 1979, in 1970, sorry. And as you can always see, our name in Danish is Institutet for Fremsesforskning. So I think that it's a nice thing to learn for you guys. <laughs> well, let me just explain you why we always put future studies in plural. It's because our way of uh, looking at the future is that the future does not exist. That what exists is several possible futures. What does that mean? That means that the future is now. That the future is in our hand and happening in this moment where it's being created. That gives us an opportunity to create the future and also a responsibility to create the future that we are interested in, in living in the future. So let's see, I will, one, as Svetlana so kindly said, one of our uh, tools that we look at is um, megatrends or megatendencias in Espanol. So megatrends is very different from trends. Trends which are like, what, should I have long hair or short hair or should I have a beard or no beard? Megatrends. So I always have a lot of advertising agencies calling me and saying, hey, Peter, can you please come and present the latest megatrends? And then I said, I have to disappoint you. There is no such thing as the latest megatrends. In order for the megatrends to be useful in strategic planning, they need to have a durability or long, long term. So what our megatrends we work is last at least 10, 15, 20 years so they can be encompassed in the efficient planning of the future. And another key point, I think, is, is extremely, uh, extremely, extremely important, is that to, to how, do we, how do we grasp, in the viewpoint of the Institute, the single most important thing for long-term surveillance of any company, of any organization, of any society, is the capacity to foresight. The capacity to capture what is going on in the world and how is the world changing. That is fundamental. So when we talk megatrends, yeah, I'm sorry, it's a little, let's say, <laughs> here we go. When we look at megatrends, we primarily use them to get flexibility and agility in present day when we take decisions relevant to the future. And they help us spur innovation and creativity in understanding what is going to impact the world in the future. So, and we say that Many people, they try to ignore the megatrend, they try to ignore the changes that are happening, then you are fucked up, sorry, <laughs> then, you are, then you are screwed. <laughs> because there is one thing you, <laughs> sorry my language, <laughs> <There's> <laughs> there is one thing you can't do that is hiding from a megatrend. If you try to hide for the development, hide for the, what's going on, then you are going to get in trouble. So it's better prepare for them for the future. At present time, we work with 14 megatrends. I will only elaborate on a few of them today because of the time is limited. But this is not to understand that this is the only 14 megatrends that exist. No, 
that exist thousands of megatrends. But we believe that these four scenes here pretty much captures what we need to look out for in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And just let me mention some of them. We have some democratization is one of our mega trends. We are seeing a lot of movement that is giving power to the people. Suddenly we are having a, a situation right now where more people than ever has the opportunity to give voice, have a say, be heard. We call that democratization that is changing our society drastically. And then we have polarization. Another mega trend I think is very important for the agenda of this event that we are seeing, due to globalization, technological development, and other happenings, we are seeing that all societies on the planet are getting more and more polarized. Even the Scandinavian societies that has been known to be very equal the last 10 years, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, all has become more polarized. So this is something we need to address when we think about the future. <laughs> okay, and then I like to start with a quote sometimes when I talk. This is Fidel Castro. And this is, uh, this, he said this in 1973. The United States will come to dialogue with Cuba when the President of the United States is black and there's a Latin American Pope in the world. Was Fidel Castro an excellent futurist? No. Fidel Castro, he said this because he was sure that Never. This would never, never, never happen. No? So <laughs> I, always, I like to use this because one thing we know in, at Copenhagen Institute is that the future is more crazy and more local than we can ever imagine. And many things, the more radical we think about the future, the better. That's why working with the future, we need to think in radical uh, alternative scenarios for what could happen. So we can never be safe. The most crazy thing can happen and have a tendency to happen. I think I need to say no more when we think about the present situation in Washington. <laughs> that we, we are living craziness. <laughs> so I, and then I would like to talk a little bit about technological development, as I said. Because we can never know, we never know, only in hindsight, we can know what is actually changing our world. When the cell phone appeared, the first time the cell phone appeared, everybody here remembers, I think. We would not have imagined the transformative potential that the cell phone ended up with. In the beginning, the average uh, viewpoint was, well, okay, that's great. We will talk a little bit more with each other. But no one imagined the profound way it's going, it was, it's go, it's ended up changing our society. So, and then when we look about, so we never know what in 10 years time, when we, when we meet here in 10 years for the cassette at 20 anniversary, what will have impacted our world? I will tell you one thing, we have no idea. We really have no idea. So the only logical thing to do is prepare for a lot of things and keep monitoring it. So one of the things that that is basically the cell phone is connecting us all. So we can say that we are seven billion networks today. That is drastically and rapidly changing power structures all over the world. And we believe that it's a very important agenda to align to, these new, um, to this new scenario and align with the mega trend in order to fast track development. Because today we are all connected. So we, we saw that in the last century, we gained more or less freedom from wanting. We were satisfied with our needs and we almost destroyed the planet in the course of getting everything we needed. And now what we are seeing as, a, as another drastic move is freedom from owning, or what we call libertad de ser dono. And now we see that all these people we have reality shows that are helping people clean out all their mess because all the products that we buy are making us sick. They're cluttering us up. Now we have this movement of minimalism, live simple. So we say that freedom from owning is a scenario that we described back in 2008 and it's happening full on right now. And it's changing how our society is working. So what we have, the basically thing it says is changing where is the value 
And we are seeing a profound shift from the value before used to be in the transaction, now it's in the relation. That changes everything, especially for bank and accountants. Because how do you capture value when it's no longer interesting to have a product, but you just need to have access to a service, like you see Uber, Facebook, Spotify, etc. So what we are saying is happening in this scenario is that the world, people are no longer buying products. No, people are buying experiences. People are buying relationships. People are no longer buying products. And the problem we see today is that 95% of all organizations are still selling products. And the accounting world is still accounting assets in an old style way. So we, we, we need to transform together in order to make the new world of what's coming seem more logical and more potential. So the value is no longer in the traditional assets, but it's moved to the relationship. So let me get back to the smartphone. What we are seeing right now is that we've had this explosion of social, red, social networks. We are all posting on Facebook or on Instagram, but that's changing. Last year, the number of people using social media was surpassed by people using social messaging. So we are seeing a future where dialogue is key. Just to come back to the democratization process that we are seeing, this is a new demand for the state to be in constant dialogue. Before, we are saying that we have a society that's based on individuals. Now it's based on situations. I'll bet you, without knowing for sure, but I'll bet you that this conference 10 years ago was much more with lectures, 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 and then maybe one debate. Am I right? <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> but now we, have, now we want to be in, in transformation all the time. We want to debate, we want to talk, we want to dialogue. That is also something that is putting a new toll on governments and institutions and companies. Always to be able, able um, up to share the data, like we saw so many times on this panel, that data sharing and reliable data sharing is key to have an efficient dialogue. <laughs> Let's go on here. Well, the time is short. It's pretty difficult to capture the future in 15 minutes, but I'm trying here. <laughs> Let's go on. So, <laughs> one of the changes that we think that could be another change, that maybe in 10 years' time, when we look back the last 10 years, what is the, heaven, the most drastic influence on our world? Right now, a lot of our scientists believe that it's a major shift in the energy sector to solar and uh, wind energy. That will have tremendous job in front of us in order to change the traditional infrastructure, but also something that can help us align even more with a more sustainable future. So probably in the next 10 years, what is changing the most will be this major shift in the energy sector. Another, one of our other mega trends is disinvolvimento demográfico, or uh, demographic development, where one of them we have, <coughs> for instance, the new status of the female. I was so pleased to see the panel that opened up today consisted of three strong women, and our panel today, the two strong women here, because probably, when we look back in 10, 20 years' time and look back for the last 50 years, we will not say that a stupid smartphone changed our society, no. What changed our society, the most impact, was probably the new status of the female. That is maybe what is changing more our society, the new roles between the gender. And oh, it's just to get back. <laughs> and then also we are expecting democratization or urbanization. I'm not so sure about the numbers here in Mexico, but for instance, in Brazil, where, we are, where I'm based, we, have a, we are living in a country that is 85 to 90 percent urbanized, meaning that 85 to 90 percent of the population is living in cities more than 100,000 people. This is a pattern that we expect the globe to follow by 2050. Right now, the average is around 50% of the global population is living in larger cities. This will also be a very important agenda to address. How can we maintain sustainable when we get to mega cities, more than 100 million people? That's a whole other agenda.
but in this technological development, we are saying that right now, 10 years ago, the music industry was disrupted. disrupted. Five years ago, the TV and the entertainment industry was disrupted. We are saying that right now, there has never been a greater number of industries that are being completely disrupted due to the technological development. That leaves us with a lot of responsibility to address the vast problems that are coming. One example here <coughs> is automatization. No? So we, that's every, the, technolog the, the technological development is going so fast that jobs can be lost. If we look at the, the last 100 years, the average German worker works 1,000 uh, hours less in 100 years' time. If we follow that line, by, 2080, by 2054, the German worker will work zero hours. <laughs> so we are actually also coming into a future where it's possible that we don't need to work. So how will we set up society? How will we do accounting? How will we pay, check? how will we pay checks? How will we survive? How will we have money? So the Copenhagen Institute, we are a little bit different from Singularity University. We are not so focused only on technological development. It will change our world, but the point is we have time. We have time to adapt. It's not happening from one day to the other. But it's also an important issue to be addressed for sure in the future. How are we going to have sustainable, responsible societies where there might not be work enough for everyone? We believe that we will have the time to do a transition and we believe we will have time to transition into more meaningful jobs and more meaningful lives. As I just had a discussion at breakfast today, if we look 50 years ago from today, we can all here agree that the world changed dramatically for the better. No, I guess. <laughs> yeah. so, so last year I will say another thing that we are just to think about is that we are expecting automatic cars by 2035. 50% of all vehicles in the world we are expecting to be fully automized. Today, every infrastructure, every society we live in is 100% determined by the car 1.0. By 2035, we will see a change of society that will be 100% determined by the automatic car. That will change everything, we, we, we believe, in a, in, a, in a good point. So why are we in Latin America? Because we, we also see a world where future trends is not only coming from the state and Northern Europe, but also from other, from other parts of the globe, like Latin America. For instance, here in Latin America, we have much more trouble. We have much more conflict in society, in our govern, governance. We don't th see this as a negative. Like in Brazil, we have the Gambiara or Chetinho. The Latin American culture is much more uh, ad adaptable to crisis. When a crisis happened here, people find another job, move on. In Denmark, for instance, when a crisis happened, people get scared and go to the government and wants money. <laughs> but here we see people are crossing barriers like uh, igual. So to, in order to, in all these drastic changes that we are seeing in the future, in order to have long-term value creation we need to collaborate to transform. There is no government that can do this job alone. There's no industry that can do this job alone. And I think we have heard this many times, but we believe and we have seen in the past that actually transforming society for the better is great business. So on this note, I will say that in the future, it's about becoming a protagonist of it and not the victim. And we can only do that by doing, because we can have one thing we know for sure, if you are not creating the future that you want tomorrow, someone else is. So this will be my final words. Sorry if I took a little bit too long time. So, so thank you, Peter. Uh, it looks like technology, different de demography, urbanization, and empowerment of women is going to define our future. So with this, I'm uh, going to pass microphone to Tim, who, uh, in addition to his many responsibilities, uh, is leading the Strategic Investor Initiative in the United States, which brings together CEOs of the largest uh, private sector companies 
and uh, CEOs of uh, investment management institutions such as BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. I also have to um, say that uh, Tim is a friend and uh, in, in the context of the female empowerment, some of you may remember uh, this very famous statue of the bull on the Wall Street. Remember New York Financial District, big bulls? So a few months ago, some of you may have read this, one of these big uh, uh, investment management companies put a statue of a defiant girl who stands like this and looks at the bull. So uh, this statue was supposed to be there just for a few days, and now, in part thanks to Tim, it is going to be there for one year. So with this, <laughs> microphone is yours. Thanks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this mic. Is it on? I'm gonna sit and have no slides. Andrea is going to have slides, and it's going to be a surprise if she stands or not. And in Spanish. And, in Spanish. and then Ed is just a total surprise. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, Felan. I have to correct the record. I, it was not me. It was lots of other people. Uh, I tried to make a few phone calls, called a few friends. But it's just great that the fearless girl statue is there standing in front of the bull on Wall Street. And I'm also proud that my organization, CECP, that I'll talk to, we all got our picture taken in front of it. And to get your picture taken in front of the bull uh, with the fearless girl statue, you have to wait in line about 20 minutes because there's a crowd all the time, which is interesting. So uh, in my academic background, uh, the titles of the three most important, I think, papers that I've written that are posted on the Harvard Business School Working Knowledge website are called Implied Materiality in Credit Ratings, The Climate Custodians, and Materiality in Corporate Governance. So those are the topics that I'm going to cover today, but specifically materiality as it relates to the SDGs and sustainability and reporting, and I'm going to use climate as an example of this. So, and again, all in the private sector context. I'd like to do a few uh, audience polls, though, first. How many that are in the room today are accountants? <laughs> Great, a lot, tremendous, thank you very much. How many of the accountants in the audience today, just the accountants, sorry, not others, Tim, keep your hand down, uh, have heard of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB. Less, okay, fine, thank you very much. Um, so, thank you, Peter, for your talk. You know, I do agree that the future is now, and we need to help create the future, yeah. given these durable megatrends. Um, the, the organization that Svetlana referred to, uh, called CECP, that I am a member of, and I'm the research director at, um, they were founded by the famous actor Paul Newman and John Whitehead, who was the former chairman of Goldman Sachs, in the late 90s with the idea that corporations can do more and do better for society. It's a member organization of about 200 CEOs, basically the top half of the S&P 500, the largest corporations in the United States, plus a few from outside the U.S. like Unilever. And as we all have heard uh, recently, between corporations and investors, there has been kind of a blame game about being short term. CEOs say, you investors are putting pressure on us. You, you investors are too short term. The uh, investors say, no, you CEOs are too short term. When we get our CEOs together each year, uh, we've heard this blame game. So. Uh, the board of directors of CECP got uh, funding from the Ford Foundation, from Bloomberg, and from another foundation in the United States to start the Strategic Investor Initiative to attack this blame game and to get the biggest investors and the biggest companies together to talk about the long term. Because if you don't have the long term, if you don't have the future, if you just have now, all you have from an audit point of view, anything that's material is just the financials, just returns. But if you think longer term, 
then you can think about other things potentially being material. And when I talk about that, I'm going to tee up Andrea that's going to talk a lot more smartly about this than I can, because that's what she focuses on at the GRI. In the world of CEOs and what they do, they try to listen to their biggest investors, but sometimes their biggest investors are not the loudest. Uh, in the United States, and for most companies in the world, the three biggest investors are BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. BlackRock, five and a half trillion dollars under management. Vanguard, 4.2 trillion dollars under management. State Street, about two and a half trillion dollars under management. But State Street is also the world's largest custody bank, so they get credit for a little bit more. When uh, at our gathering of CEOs, the first ever st what's called strategic investor, uh, CEO investor forum, where CEOs give long-term plans to a group of 200 investors, the opposite of a quarterly call. Bill McNabb, the CEO of Vanguard, kicked it off on a panel with a reporter from the Financial Times. And that reporter asked Bill McNabb, who manages $4.2 trillion, one of the biggest shareholders in most publicly held companies all around the world. Bill, you've been talking a lot about the duty to society that your company has and that corporations have. Which corporations are actually fulfilling that? Which are the best? And he said, well, it's a hard question to answer. It's definitely not the majority of corporations, but it certainly is the 200 corporations that are members of CECP. Now, I keep saying these letters, CECP. What does that mean? Well, today, it means nothing. It just means CECP, but there's a reason. It used to mean, when Paul Newman founded it, the Committee Encouraging Corporate Philanthropy, because decades ago, the do good for society part of corporations was philanthropy. But our CEOs have told us that that no longer is the case. That having a purpose and fulfilling your duties to material, important, significant stakeholders, just a few of them, beyond shareholders, is what helps to preserve or even create long-term value. So, about five years ago, CECP got a new CEO, Daryl Brewster, who was a big public company CEO in the U.S., and changed their name to CECP, no longer just focused on philanthropy, but working with our CEOs on purpose and stakeholders beyond shareholders to create long-term value. You can look on our CECP uh, YouTube website, you just on YouTube, look for CECP, and there's a playlist for our CEO Investor Forum. One of the forums was a panel, besides all the CEOs that presented that are going to talk about everything that I'm talking about today. You can look at it yourself. But there was a panel where we had a diverse group on the panel, trying to be more diverse. Uh, but one key member of the panel was the treasurer of the World Bank, Aruma Ote, the former head of the Securities and Exchange Commission in Nigeria. And she articulated the World Bank position on trying to work with the private sector to promote the sustainable development goals and sustainability and long-termism through the kind of things that the World Bank does in the developing world and increasingly in the entire world because we're all interconnected. I'd like to talk a little bit about, before I get into materiality, I'd like to talk about climate as an example of thinking long term and how many companies are leading. When you look at the, the videos of um, uh, CEOs presenting their long-term plans, you'll see some of them talking about sustainability and climate and green energy. You will, one CEO you won't see is the CEO of Goldman Sachs, who was just in the news to say that he disagreed with our president that when Donald Trump decided that the U.S. would pull out of the Paris Climate Accords, the CEO of Goldman Sachs said, 
that's probably not a good idea because climate is actually important to long-term value. And there's big opportunities in that space. And I'm going to talk about Tim a little bit later, Tim Nixon, but make sure you stay for the final session to hear more about this. There's examples of our companies, though, that, that have seen and demonstrated that sustainability and taking action on climate to be more green, to use renewable energy, to reduce their carbon footprint actually makes them money. And they were surprised at this. Uh, the CEO of BD, a large medical products manufacturer in the United States, has changed over most of the energy used in their factories to renewable sources and have, have found that they are saving a lot of money that is helping to fuel their growth. A lot of this growth is in the developing world. Almost every one of our CEOs, when they talk about climate, says that they start with the sustainable development goals because they know that the sustainable development goals have wide support around the world and all large corporations are starting to expand rapidly in developing markets. So by starting with the sustainable development goals, it's very easy to pick a few and this whole idea of picking a few things, not doing everything is critical as I talk about that later in materiality. But I wanna also say that this is not the movement of corporations to take action themselves in their own economic interest. And as our CEOs have talked about on our YouTube channel, I'm only gonna say that five more times, um, is not only driven by the numbers, it's not only, only driven by profits. There is also coming national and global regulations and standards to help protect us globally from the terrible effects of the climate that we all share. And again, please stay for the final uh, session where Tim Nixon, Tim, just raise your hand so everybody can see it. Tim Nixon, my good friend from Thomson Reuters, just had a major uh, paper released in London the day before yesterday. He flew over here. He's gonna talk about this um, very important work about climate and how there's really opportunities uh, for some big corporations all around the world. So now I'd like to switch over to some of these, as, as Peter talked about, new assets that really haven't been evaluated before. You know, in some of the other sessions, I've talked with uh, some of the other speakers uh, from PwC and from Deloitte about this whole idea is you're doing audits. And again, from the accountants, how many here audit publicly held companies? If you raise your hand, please. Any auditors that audit publicly held companies? One. Okay, I'm gonna assume there's a few more. Um, when you audit companies, this whole idea of carbon means, and renewables, means that companies that have land might have assets that could be used as carbon offsets. And the goodwill with stakeholders and the things you're doing in society actually has value, future value, there really is, there is actually, it's hard to value this because there's so many different standards on this now and the standards don't agree. Climate, they're starting to come together a little bit, but I'm not gonna talk about that anymore because I know Tim's gonna talk about that. But I think there's a few simplifying constructs, simplifying ways to think about valuing, auditing, assessing, accounting for these new assets that may be material to some of your clients. Bill Platt, in, a, in this room yesterday, I think sitting in this seat, he's from Deloitte, talked about the Edelman Trust Barometer and how trust in institutions is eroding globally as Ed, uh, Richard Edelman, who's on the board of CECP, uh, has talked about. Um, and that was further amplified by Roby Sendowich of the World Bank, who said, in building trust, in rebuilding trust that the Edelman Trust Barometer says is eroding as far as the public's trust around the world of corporations, that trust, Roby said, is two-sided. There needs to be trust between at least two parties. Well, in our research, 
uh, Harvard professor, now Oxford professor, Bob Eccles, and I call this social construction. That trust, as Roby pointed out, is constructed between two parties. Well, I'd like to then give you kind of a, a, a tip, uh, a shortcut, to start to think about how to evaluate these new assets that Peter talked about. And that is to use what we call the social construction of materiality. And in a very simple way, it simply is thinking about material to who. And when you think about material to who, you start to think about stakeholders beyond shareholders and how they can add value to corporations. I'd like to give you a couple examples in Latin America of where some of the world's biggest corporations are actually doing this. If you could just look up anywhere the world's top three or four mining companies have significant reserves and assets in Latin America. Most of them are on indigenous people's lands. Now over the years we all know that there has been conflicts here in Mexico, in Brazil, in many countries with indigenous peoples over many things, but one of them has been resources. And it's not just Latin America, it's in Canada even. There's been violent conflicts over this. And now the biggest mining companies in the world have board committee level oversight over indigenous people's concerns because that's where they get their license to operate. If, if the mine, if the, if the area where they're going to mine is shut down because of unrest, there's a lot of sunk costs that in the future they're not going to be able to realize, but for just beyond climate. And I'm just, here I'm just talking about not coal mining, but metals mining. As many miners have told me, without copper, there is no smart grid, there is no electric cars, there is no solar panels, there is a lot of sustainability for climate doesn't work. So stakeholders beyond shareholders, material to who, will help narrow the focus of issues that might be material, of new assets that might be material. It's not everything. I've heard companies down here, I'm talking in the hallway, talk about applying the Dow Jones Sustainable Sustainability Index for their clients. I would warn that you're gonna, GE has found, General Electric, that it spends 75 people, full-time equivalent employees worldwide, evaluating immaterial items for the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. They're not doing the Dow Jones Sustainability Index anymore because they want to focus their resources on those few stakeholder groups, those few issues that are material to their long-term future financial growth. Um, this is fueled by research that Bob Beckles and I have done in 34 countries, including a lot in Brazil and Mexico. In Mexico, we use the law firm of CCN. And in uh, Brazil, we use the law firm of Matos Filos uh, to post legal memos on the American Bar Association website and the UN Global Compact um, that yes, corporations are allowed in every country in Latin America, their boards are allowed to consider other stakeholders. I, as I'm getting near the end of my time and before I hand it off to Andrea to talk in much more intelligently about materiality than I could, um, research. My good friend George Seraphim of Harvard has a research, a paper, you can easily Google it, called First Evidence of Materiality that simply shows that over a 10 year period, companies that make the choice to focus on a few material issues that are aligned with their industry according to the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB, drastically outperform the, the general benchmark over the long term. So focusing on sustainability will help your clients meet standards, to learn about that, attend Tim Nixon's session, and to learn more about how to focus on it materially from a financial point of view, from a stakeholder point of view, I now hand it off to Andrea. But I know Svetlana's gonna introduce first, thank you.
results. Now the question is how to move the markets and what financial and non-financial information, uh, what role can play in this process. So uh, Andre, as I mentioned, is the head of the Global Reporting Initiative for uh, Latin America. So she is going uh, to tell us more about the work this organization is doing in this area. ¿Me oyen? Sí, perfecto. Buenos días, ¿cómo están? Muchas gracias a Svetlana y a mis colegas por la introducción. Siguiendo con los cuestionarios y las encuestas, quisiera preguntar ¿cuántos de ustedes han tenido el placer de recibir un reporte de sostenibilidad de una empresa latinoamericana? Pocos, muy, muy, muy poquitos. Entonces, a riesgo de, de ser repetitiva en tu caso, voy a ir poco a poco. Sabemos que los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible son 17, hay 169 metas y usted es un empresario y está sentado y usted quiere contribuir al desarrollo sostenible, pero no sabe por dónde arrancar. La realidad de las empresas latinoamericanas es que muchas venían con una tradición filantrópica muy fuerte, muy arraigada a la cultura hispanoamericana. Y es en ese contexto donde el GRI, oh, creo que no hay, hay un slide que no me sale, el GRI, que es el creador de los estándares de rendición de cuentas en información de sostenibilidad más utilizados del mundo, empieza a pensar en el concepto de materialidad, es decir, no todas las empresas pueden hacer absolutamente todo, usted tiene que priorizar en materia de desarrollo sostenible, ninguna empresa puede hacer los 17 ODS ni las 169 metas y llevamos acompañando este concepto de la necesidad de medir, lo que no se mide no se gestiona y lo que no se gestiona no se puede cambiar. Y esa rigurosidad debe ser también aplicada a la información ambiental, social y de gobierno corporativo. Llevamos alrededor de 20 años construyendo las métricas para poder medir lo ambiental, lo social, lo económico y lo de gobierno corporativo y en el año 2015 hicimos el salto de pasar de generaciones de directrices a un estándar. Y acá les pido a los que vienen del mundo de lo financiero y lo contable que se imaginen cómo lo hicieron ustedes en su momento. Arrancó un proceso evolutivo donde arrancó también por directrices hasta que hoy ya están ustedes en un nivel de estandarización mucho más alto. Hacia eso nos queremos mover desde el GRI. El punto central de lo que les mencionaba hace un momento Tim, del GRI y de cualquier buena estrategia en sostenibilidad es el concepto de materialidad. Para el GRI, retomando lo que nos decía Peter, hay una manera, hay una representación visual de esa materialidad, que es una matriz, que le va a permitir a usted ver lo que dio arriba en, en relacionamiento con grupos de interés o como le, le decía Peter, democratización. Oía yo, el reporte de sostenibilidad es un balance entre lo que la empresa quiere contar lo que sus grupos de interés necesitan saber. Entonces la primera parte siempre es que la empresa salga más allá de efectivamente el accionista y vaya a mirar esos grupos de interés relevantes que necesitan saber con respecto a la organización y al mismo tiempo que haga un análisis muy detallado de cuáles son sus impactos y ojo porque acá es importante entender que desde el GRI nosotros planteamos que es una discusión de cuáles son mis impactos externos, es decir, yo cómo impacto el capital social, yo cómo impacto el capital natural cuáles son mis impactos externos y esto al final se convierte en un radar de temas y en las empresas latinoamericanas los invito a que el, los clientes que ustedes tengan revisen, la, buena, la buena, buena parte de las empresas tiene reportes de sostenibilidad, se termina convirtiendo en un mapa de riesgos no tradicionales. Entonces temas que empiezan a aparecer de comunidades, de protestas, que a lo mejor eran tradicionalmente manejados por un área pequeña, el área de comunicaciones, el área de responsabilidad social, empezamos a ver cómo a través de este análisis de materialidad que está alineado al core del negocio y de la estrategia, empieza a subir en la escala a la hora de toma de decisiones por parte de las organizaciones. Esta es la columna vertebral de lo que es el GRI y de ahí para adelante lo que hacemos es a través de unas métricas lograr que la empresa rinda cuentas y esa rendición de cuentas estamos absolutamente convencidos que es el primer paso para la generación de confianza. Mencionaba Tim hace un momento el barómetro de la confianza de Edelman, les voto un dato en particular, en nuestra región 
la gente sí confía en las empresas curiosamente, hay un diferencial con respecto al, al resto de la muestra donde la confianza en las empresas cae, en nuestra región aumenta y es superior a la que se tiene en gobiernos o la que se tiene en medios de comunicación, lo que quiere decir que hay una responsabilidad desde el punto de vista del empresariado de mantener esa confianza. Y digamos que esto se traduce que efectivamente en memorias de sostenibilidad o reportes de sostenibilidad. Un poco imagínense que ustedes están manejando un carro, nosotros manejábamos los carros en los años 80 con un espejo, ¿verdad? El espejo de este lado. Esa es la información financiera, uno puede seguir manejando el carro con un solo espejo. Es más, uno hasta podría manejar el carro sin espejo, pero ¿en qué va a incurrir? En riesgos y va a perder visión. Lo que está haciendo la información en sostenibilidad es abrir el otro espejo le va a permitir a usted tener una visión integral de usted para dónde quiere ir, cómo puede adelantar, cómo puede aprovechar oportunidades, qué riesgos se le vienen desde la toma de decisiones. Conscientes de eso, esta es una encuesta de KPMG que muestra que efectivamente los reportes y la información de sostenibilidad van al alza, van aumentando especialmente y sin duda en las empresas más grandes del mundo, 93% de las 250 empresas más grandes del mundo hoy elaboran memorias de sostenibilidad y Latinoamérica en particular es bastante cercano, eh, especialmente en las grandes, a la rendición de cuentas, en particular Brasil más los cuatro países de Alianza del Pacífico y Argentina. Esto solo para mostrarles qué lugar ocupa Latinoamérica a nivel mundial, casi que el 20% de los reportes GRI en este momento, del Global Reporting Initiative, son de Latinoamérica y Latinoamérica tiene dos países en el top 10 de reportantes GRI, Brasil y Colombia. Este aumento en cantidad de reportes se dio hasta este punto, si se quiere, bajo un elemento de voluntariedad, donde uno decía, qué lindo, qué bien, está rindiendo cuentas, hay una ventaja competitiva del que rinde cuentas. La realidad en la región y en el mundo es que nos estamos moviendo hacia la institucionalización de la rendición de cuentas en sostenibilidad. ¿Cómo? A través de la política pública. Estamos viendo legislación, Parlamento de la Unión Europea, directiva sobre reporte no financiero que hace obligatorio la rendición de cuentas en Europa. En el caso de Bolivia acabamos de ver que lo volvieron obligatorio para sector financiero, en el Perú, diciembre de 2015, vuelven obligatoria la rendición de cuentas para eh, las empresas que están listadas en bolsa, Chile, desde el regulador ha hecho esfuerzos similares, Colombia lo tiene para todas sus concesiones de infraestructura 4G, entonces estamos viendo cómo se va formalizando, cómo este movimiento que inicialmente fue voluntario se está moviendo hacia la regularización en la medida en que los gobiernos empiezan a solicitarlo en política pública, la responsabilidad de ustedes como auditores va a ir aumentando. Este es un poquito el ranking a nivel regional, el líder a nivel regional es Brasil, seguido de Colombia, seguido de México, Argentina y Perú. Chile no aparece todavía dentro de los líderes, eh, dentro de los top 5, sin embargo, con los desarrollos que ha tenido en política pública, estamos seguros de que los números aumentarán. Esto, por supuesto, es un indicador de cantidad de reportes. Ahora, cuando uno quisiera entrar a mirar esto, ¿hasta qué punto está permeando en nuestras empresas? El GRI, el año pasado, lanzó una encuesta con A.T. Kearney, los resultados de una encuesta y con apoyo, de hecho, de MIT, para mirar cómo se estaba direccionando las sostenibilidades del máximo órgano de dirección. En Colombia le decimos junta, en el Perú le dicen directorio, acá le dicen consejo. Y hicimos una entrevista a 275 directores de casi 550 organizaciones en seis países y les preguntamos si creían o no creían que la sostenibilidad estaba en la agenda y estaba o no estaba generando valor. El 99% dijo que sí, por supuesto. ¿Quién en pleno siglo XXI va a decir no, la sostenibilidad no genera valor? Sin embargo, cuando les preguntábamos cómo genera valor, empezábamos a ver las falencias mismas de los directores, porque el mayor diferencial para ellos está en los intangibles. Y lo sabemos bien los que llevamos trabajando en esto, cuando uno, el primer beneficio que identifica es un beneficio intangible es porque todavía no ha terminado de entender el impacto que esto tiene en el core del negocio. Y vemos que ya hay un 59% que tiene una identificación temprana de riesgos. Observábamos también que los directores latinoamericanos conocen el concepto, pero muchos de ellos, cerca de un 60%, aún no tienen una opinión formada con respecto a la sostenibilidad. Si yo no tengo una opinión formada no puedo actuar es decir, no apropiado realmente el concepto, entonces vemos que falta apropiación. Y ya cuando mirábamos cómo estaba la gobernanza al interior de las empresas, le decíamos quién direcciona la sostenibilidad. Ellos decían, el 60% nosotros creemos que lo debe direccionar el board, la junta directiva. 
Sin embargo, la realidad es que lo, hoy lo manejan los equipos, la administración, 100% de la administración. Y cuando les preguntábamos, ¿cree usted que la administración cuenta con las capacidades para gestionar la sostenibilidad? Más de la mitad nos decía que no. Entonces empezábamos a observar inconsistencias. Y les preguntamos también, ¿cuáles han sido los temas que usted más ha tratado en sus directorios en los últimos dos años? Y nos decían, el top, gobierno corporativo. Seguido de prácticas laborales, seguridad industrial y trabajo digno. ¿Y cuáles son los que usted quisiera profundizar? Y miren lo que nos aparece, medio ambiente, y ahí reunimos cambio climático, agua, etcétera, etcétera. Y transparencia y lucha contra la corrupción. Y el tema que viene desde los directorios es cadenas de suministro, que en sostenibilidad es casi que el next frontier, cadenas de suministro, pequeñas y medianas empresas, Latinoamérica es una región de pymes. Entonces, esto de movernos hacia prácticas y cadenas de, prácticas de adquisición y cadenas de suministro es, es esencial. Les preguntábamos hasta qué punto eran ellos conscientes de su deber fiduciario con respecto a la información no financiera que sale a los mercados. Es decir, es imposible que un balance salga si la Junta y el directorio no lo ha revisado. Nos preguntábamos si lo mismo sucedía con la información de sostenibilidad. La respuesta ni siquiera la pongo acá porque es, es, es tan bajito el número de, de miembros de directorio que tienen un rol activo desde el deber fiduciario de revisar la información que se entrega a los mercados en sostenibilidad que casi que la, la, la línea base para el trabajo del griesero, de ahí para arriba avanzamos todos. Pero no nos quedamos ahí, les preguntamos a usted qué quisiera ver, y acá hay otro mensaje importante para auditores. ¿A usted qué le hace falta para involucrarse más con la sostenibilidad? Lo primero nos decían capacitación. Yo no termino de entender esto, esto, qué quiere decir, qué es la materialidad, cómo defino la materialidad. Y lo segundo, información profunda y confiable. Una de las cosas que más salió en la encuesta, nos decían, mire, nos llegan las cifras de sostenibilidad, nosotros no sabemos si eso es confiable, si no es confiable, si puedo tomar decisiones con base en eso o no. Y el tercero, eh, quisieran un involucramiento mucho más acerta, asertivo en el análisis de materialidad que hace cada una de las organizaciones. Esto, digamos que en términos muy generales, es el reality check. Más allá de los números de reportes que tenemos en la región, hay todavía retos muy importantes a la hora de apropiar la gobernanza de las sostenibilidades de las empresas y de entender el deber fiduciario de los administradores en el siglo XXI. El GRI en este contexto no es el único estándar de reportes, sí es el, el estándar más utilizado del mundo, pero no es el único. Y como el hermano mayor en la mesa, trabaja conjuntamente para lograr la armonización. Me imagino que este, este mismo movimiento que estamos dando nosotros se dio en la información financiera y tenemos colaboraciones con organizaciones e iniciativas internacionales, todas estas que van desde el Integrated Reporting Council, el, la Organización Internacional de Empleadores, la ISO, el CDP, el Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative, la IFC, buscamos tener alianzas con tantas organizaciones como sea posible, ¿para qué?, para lograr armonizar y reducir los costos de transacción por parte del sector privado. Lo más absurdo sería que una empresa, que es la realidad hoy en día, tenga que contestar alrededor de unos 40 cuestionarios al año, y a eso súmenle, en Latinoamérica es muy popular el Dow Jones, entonces ahora a esto súmenle además el Dow Jones Sustainability Index, que es otro cuestionario más los cuestionarios que se le envían al gobierno, y con esto prácticamente dejo de trabajar y me dedico a reportar. Entonces nosotros conscientes de eso decimos no, acá hay que buscar alineación y armonización de manera tal que se puedan reducir los costos de transacción y que estemos hablando realmente de que el reporte sea efectivo, effective reporting, que no se nos vuelva el fin reportar, ese no es el fin. Y tenemos una colaboración técnica con, con tres de los temas más claves en este momento. Eh, SASB, que creo que lo mencionó Tim muy bien, tenemos una por primera vez una colaboración mucho más cercana de la que hemos tenido nunca, de sentarnos a mirar efectivamente cómo podemos trabajar de la mano, esto funciona básicamente para las empresas que tienen que presentar información en los Estados Unidos, no necesariamente para las empresas en Latinoamérica, pero en la medida en que usted tenga relaciones comerciales con, puede verse influenciado y tiene una serie de análisis sectoriales que pueden ser interesantes para las empresas. El IRC, que es el que digamos lo ayudamos a crear nosotros, sirve, no sé cuántos de ustedes lo conozcan acá, manos, ninguno. Uno. Bien, el, conse el Consejo de Reportes Integrados básicamente tiene un marco para integrar la información, que es el sueño de todos, cómo logramos integrar lo financiero y lo no financiero y trabajamos en la creación de un grupo a nivel mundial con reportantes para ver esto, cómo pasa de ser una muy buena idea a una realidad. 
y digamos que en esto llevamos ya, ya tuvimos un, un primer año de trabajo, estamos en un segundo año de trabajo para que desde la práctica las organizaciones reportantes nos muestren cuáles son esos retos que están teniendo, porque al final queremos lo mismo y es poder lograr mostrar el valor que esto genera desde el punto de vista de la organización. Y finalmente el trabajo con ODS, eh, digamos que desde el punto de vista de los ODS tenemos dos líneas de trabajo importantes, una que está relacionada con la parte técnica de los estándares y de los indicadores y es que hay por lo menos una métrica GRI que le hace match a cada uno de los ODS. Entonces estamos trabajando para que haya lo que se conoce como cumplimiento automático y es que si usted tiene un reporte GRI, su gobierno local en cada país lo reconozca como parte de la contribución que tiene que hacerse a los ODS por parte del sector privado. Eso digamos que es en, en una primera medida. Y en una segunda medida somos conscientes de que hay métricas que faltan, porque los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible fueron mucho más allá de lo que el GRI tenía. Entonces hay una serie de indicadores que no tenemos y que tampoco tiene el Pacto Mundial de Naciones Unidas y estamos trabajando en un grupo, primero con empresas, para entender cuáles son los retos a la hora de reportarlos, porque los ODS suenan muy bien cuando son 17, siguen sonando bien cuando son 169, pero cuando usted ya lo baja a los 231 indicadores que ha fijado en Nueva York, ya se empieza a enredar. Entonces nosotros lo que queremos es poder orientar a la empresa para que vaya a hacer ese reporte y ese reporte realmente contribuya al desarrollo sostenible. Y el segundo, la segunda plataforma que tenemos es, con, es una plataforma multiactor para trabajar en el futuro del reporte desde el punto de vista de los ODS. Esto que incluye Big Data y Open Data, desagregación de datos, cómo podemos contar una historia en Nueva York que no sea solo la contribución del sector público, sino que muestre una historia de país, una historia de región, donde los datos estén vivos y de alguna manera no dependamos tanto del PDF, que es lo que tenemos hoy en día desde la rendición de cuentas del sector privado. Quería dejarlos con, con una frase, digamos que en, en materia de desarrollo sostenible y de estándares en rendición de cuentas en sostenibilidad, este es el reto más grande que tenemos, la armonización desde el punto de vista nuestro. ¿Por qué? Porque cuando todo el mundo lanza para lados diferentes, la empresa se confunde y hace el mínimo. Y dice, yo me quedo con el mínimo. Entonces, la prioridad de nuestro nuevo uh, director ejecutivo y la prioridad de toda la organización es poder estar comprometidos a aumentar la armonización y simplificación en el panorama de los reportes. Esto, digamos que es necesario para que ustedes puedan hacer unas, unas verificaciones de esos reportes mucho más precisas y mucho más técnicas de las que tenemos hoy en día. Con esto quisiera yo concluir mis 15 minutos. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Andrea. And now uh, we are moving to Ed Alova Kerry. Ed is the director of the governance practice in the World Bank. He also has a background in both accounting, auditing, and the management. So he will uh, help us to bring all this together and tie this to your daily lives. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Svetlana. So, as Tim said earlier on, uh, <laughs> it wasn't obvious whether I was going to stand up or sit down to make my uh, uh, remarks. Uh, but given the flow of, uh, of the presentation, uh, those that had PowerPoints, they stood up to make their presentation. And since uh, Jim, I mean, since Tim sat down, so I will do the same. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I'm trying to to go, uh, what I will try to do uh, within the few minutes that I have uh, is really to uh, explain, based on what we've had uh, from the various uh, presenters, what uh, businesses can really do uh, to be able to contribute to uh, the SDGs, while at the same time creating uh, long-term values for their shareholders. So, uh, I have four points to make. So, the first one is that um, these days businesses can no longer uh, look at uh, value creation exclusively uh, in terms of uh, the financial. Um, I think there are a number of issues that have uh, impact on long term uh, value creation that has no financial counterpart or cannot be really easily measured financially. Uh, we also know that uh, businesses will need to respond uh, to these issues. I think uh, Tim mentioned one of them, uh, climate change, 
uh, but I can maybe just give uh, a few examples of these, uh, although the list uh, is, is long, but I'll just give a few examples so that we are not talking in abstract. Uh, some of these um, uh, issues, uh, sustainability issues that businesses need to be able to respond to, uh, to create long-term value, uh, some of them are driven by the impact of industrialization. So we, we've been talking about things like waste, like pollution, uh, those are driven by uh, the impact of uh, industrialization. There are things like, um, I mean, that are uh, related also to environmental changes. So things like uh, the climate change or the degeneration of the ecosystems. Um, then there are things that are related to, uh, that are more social, uh, like uh, the global uh, security issues, which are driven uh, by poverty, inequality, and other issues. Now, if we look at the perspective for, for an investor or a consumer, uh, these long-term or sustainability issues, that is issues related to the environment or social, they are important. Although I must uh, acknowledge what Tim said earlier on about the blame game between the, uh, the investors and the CEOs of companies that uh, you focus on short term, we focus, I mean, we want you to focus on long term. Uh, but if we look at it, I think we do have a growing number of investors and consumers now that really care about sustainability issues, about the environment, about social uh, uh, issues as well. So, uh, having, uh, uh, I mean, giving considerations to, to, to this fact, then it is important that uh, businesses no longer just focus on financial metrics in managing uh, uh, for the future. So, uh, so on this particular point, I would then conclude and say that uh, companies need to take action uh, to be able to manage the risks and opportunities that are associated with both environmental and social developments. And if they do that, they are going to see the impact on their bottom line. The second point I would like to make is that government do has a role to play uh, with respect to the sustainability uh, agenda. And um, before I make the points under this, I would like to acknowledge that there are different views about what the role of government should be. Uh, you have the classical liberalists who really feel that uh, what you really need is free flow of information and the free market. And then uh, companies will do the right thing, or the private sectors will do the right thing, and you don't really need government intervention. Uh, but I will also say that um, you can have you can have those who will respond to information who will, uh, play by the rule of the free market. Uh, but there are peop, uh, there are also businesses that may be laggards, or it may take them time to move. Uh, so there has to be a way to get uh, people to move uh, in the same. I mean, to get businesses to move in the same direction. So I would say government still have a role. Uh, it could be in uh, creating environmental and social standards. Uh, and facilitating uh, businesses to comply with them. It could be in putting in place relevant regulations, although, uh, as I said, you have those who feel government shouldn't be doing all those kind of regulations. But I would say that government still need to have a way to intervene to make sure that everybody uh, moves towards uh, the same uh, direction. And considering that in most of the countries, the expectation is that uh, growth, economic growth is going to be led by the private sector, uh, it is really important that uh, then businesses are encouraged to uh, consider sustainability issues in value creation so that uh, 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 they, they can continue to, to grow in the longer term. Then um, my third point is related to some of the points uh, that have been uh, alluded to by Tim and I think also by Andrea, and that relates to uh, uh, really reporting beyond uh, uh, the financial. So uh, integrated financial reporting uh, do have a key role to play uh, with respect to the sustainability agenda. And my starting point on this is that what we cannot measure, we cannot be able to manage effectively. Um, you can just imagine 
uh, standing up from here now and you want to go to the uh, to the restroom and you close your eyes I'm not sure you're going to be able to get there okay um, so we really need information uh, to be able to manage uh, most of us here in the in the room we are accountants and uh, I think what we do focus on for the most part of it is on measuring financial results uh, and we are I mean businesses are very good in that and because we measure financial results i think the prevailing model for mo for the business is that uh, we focus on short-term financial uh, uh, results so but then if we are now thinking about sustainability issues and we really uh, critically reflect on the fact on the important or importance of this for value creation in the longer term then there is need then to be able to start looking at the sustainability uh, issues and how to measure and report them. And uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, these are more of non-financial challenges. And so the question is how uh, will a company be able to um, measure uh, and report non-financial challenges? Uh, so we have the standards that have been created by uh, the um, International uh, Integrated Reporting Council. Uh, I think that provides uh, a framework, uh, I mean, a starting point for any particular business uh, to begin to create metrics and performance indicators uh, that then will stretch their reporting beyond just the financial measures and then can help them uh, to be able to get onto the track of being able to uh, uh, measure uh, and manage towards uh, sustainable value creation. Then the last point I want to make is that when we consider all this issue about value creation, uh, the, the need for sustainability and how to also use integrated reporting to be able to help in managing towards that. Um, the World Bank is currently creating, I mean partnering with uh, the governments across the world uh, to uh, enable businesses to contribute directly to the achievement of the SDGs. Um, and this is done through an approach that is called the cascade. Uh, and before I explain the cascade, I would just like to briefly uh, explain the context uh, for this uh, uh, cascade. So the context is this. We have a huge infrastructure gap that unless the uh, those gaps are financed or addressed. Uh, we cannot really achieve the SDGs by 2030. Okay? And there are various estimates about what the financing gaps are. Uh, but some of the recent estimates is that across the world globally, we need to invest between 1 and 1.3, I mean, and 1.5 trillion dollars annually to be able to uh, meet what is required under the SDGs uh, with respect to infrastructural uh, financing gap. Uh, if we come to this particular region, in particular Latin America, the estimate is we need about $300 billion investment every year uh, to be able to uh, meet the infrastructure financing gap. And the countries in this region are currently spending only about $150 billion uh, uh, Per, per year. Now, there is an irony in all of this. The public resources are limited. I think if governments have more money, considering all the other things they need to do, they will invest more in infrastructure. Uh, but the private sector has resources. And uh, let me just say a few of those uh, resources just to give you an idea. Uh, so, uh, there is a large pile of cash in the private sector that could be channeled towards the infrastructure that is needed to achieve the SDGs. U.S. Fi uh, non-financial companies alone is said to hold up to $1.7 trillion uh, in cash reserves. Uh, if you look at the U.K., uh, the companies there are holding up to about uh, $500 billion uh, also in cash reserves. Uh, globally, the estimate is about $7 trillion as at the end of uh, 2013 in terms of cash reserves. 
uh, that companies are holding and they are either invested in uh, things that generate only very little returns or uh, they, they, I mean, but can be invested elsewhere. And this is not even considering what Tim said earlier on about the trillions of dollars that institutional investors that they have. So, if we are going to then be able to meet the infrastructural gap, the financing gap, then we need to crowd in uh, the financing from the pri private sector. So that is what the World Bank Initiative uh, called Cascade is all about. And this is how it works. So um, a starting point is if government has a particular infrastructure that needs to be financed, the question is can we obtain low cost commercial financing for the project? If that is possible, then rather than using public resources or concessional funding from the multilateral development bank, then it should be to uh, get the private sector to finance. And there are examples of those things that are commercially feasible, like power generation, like uh, dam construction that could be used for irrigation, and the list goes on. Then, next, if now it is not possible to be able uh, to get cheap, uh, I mean, cost-effective uh, commercial financing, is it po uh, what is the issue? Is it because of risk? that is associated with uh, uh, government failure or market failure. If that is the case, then the World Bank will work with the government to be able to uh, reform the policies, re build, I mean, re improve regulations and pricing, and then also build capacity of institutions. Now, if after all of those has been done, there are still risks that make commercial financing impossible, then the World Bank will explore, and together with the government will explore, how some kind of credit financing to cover the risk can be, uh, can be made available. And if that then does not work, then we go to the last resort, which will be using public resources and concessional uh, funding to finance uh, infrastructure. So, and if we do that, uh, we can see that a number of the SDGs will be directly affected, although all the, all the SDGs will be affected if we are able to crowd in private sector financing uh, for infrastructure. Because as you know, if governments can spend less on one item, then they can move the money to elsewhere and spend that. Uh, but we can see direct impact on things like clean energy that uh, Tim mentioned earlier on, um, impact on clean water and sanitation, um, on SDGs relating to um, uh, sustainable cities and communities, and so on and so forth. So I would just then like to conclude that there is opportunity for the private sector uh, to be able to uh, really create long-term value uh, in a sustainable manner by partnering with the government and investing in infrastructure that directly contributes to uh, the achievement of the SDGs. So thank you. We have literally <clears throat> three minutes left because this room will have to be transformed into the plenary room again. So unfortunately, we will have to skip the questions and answers session. Uh, one key message, what I am going to do is I will ask each speaker just give one sentence which will be their key message to you. From me, the key message is integrated reporting is not the end. It's a tool to achieve much bigger goal. So think that you have the steering wheel to move your companies where they eventually need to go. <clears throat> oh, uh, uh. Well, I would say that one of the key messages to align with the, what's happening, how the world is changing, and especially align towards a new paradigm for radical transparency. The world is becoming more and more transparent. Whether we want it or not, we can see a lot of things are happening in Brazil. So align it, work with it, and then make change in, in using what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Transparency, to just build off of what Peter said. And I'll hopefully Andrea can address this. I hope so. <laughs> Believe it or not, when you're reporting, accounting for the sustainability factors, some, sometimes called the six capitals, financial, natural, manufactured relationship, human and intellectual capital, 
reporting less, being more concise, can transmit more information because it can tell your uh, constituents, your shareholders, your stakeholders that you have the ability to exercise judgment and decide what's important. Reporting less can act uh, and doing a good job at it can actually transmit more information. Menos es más, pero en la región todavía no estamos ahí. Y mi mensaje para los que pertenecen a la región es, es definitivamente ir subiendo la barra internamente. Digamos que hay una responsabilidad desde el punto de vista de la verificación, de ir subiendo la barra con respecto a la calidad de información. Es un reto inmenso que tenemos como región y si yo quisiera dejarles algo es que definitivamente la transparencia corporativa es el primer pilar de la generación de confianza, pero esa transparencia no puede parecer greenwashing, ni puede ser un compendio de acciones filantrópicas que se desarrollan hacia diciembre a través de las fundaciones empresariales. Tenemos que estar hablando de un reporte que se basa en una materialidad ambiental, social y de gobierno corporativo, con un buen relacionamiento con grupos de interés y una buena identificación por parte de los impactos. Y tenemos que estar hablando, y esto no lo mencioné, pero lo menciono ahorita, de reporte a nivel local, donde ocurren los impactos. Tenemos una tendencia en la región donde tenemos multinacionales de los Estados Unidos y de Europa que hacen un reporte en casa matriz, donde si estamos de buenas hay una página por país, para cada uno de nuestros países, donde la discusión nunca es de impactos, es generalmente de inversión social. Como representante del GRI en Hispanoamérica estoy convencida de que así como hay reporte financiero a nivel país, debe haber reporte de sostenibilidad a nivel país, porque acá es donde se dan los impactos y se afectan los capitales. Con eso quisiera dejarlos. Okay. Um, very briefly, I'll just say that uh, as accountants and uh, auditors in the room, I think we need to help uh, our businesses and uh, I mean that we work with or work for to really be able to uh, begin to focus on the issue of uh, uh, sustainability, long-term value creation, and also to seize the opportunity that is really available to contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. Thank you. On behalf of the CRESER committee, we would like to offer our speakers a small token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you so much.